Stories of Futures Past presents five stories featuring writers. Writing class by Robert Sheckley. Not in the script by Arnold Marmer. This world is ours. By Emil Pettaja. Theft. By Bill Venable. What shall it profit? By Paul Anderson. Writing class. By Robert Sheckley. Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, December 1952. Narrated by Tom Trusser. Eddie McDermott paused at the door, then caught his breath and tiptoed into the classroom and to his seat. Mort Edison, his best friend, looked at him reprovingly. The class had been in session for almost fifteen minutes, and one just didn't come late to Professor Carner's lecture, especially on the first day. Eddie breathed easier as he saw that Professor Carner's back was to the class as he completed a diagram on the blackboard. Now then, Carner said, suppose you were writing about the, ah, the Venusian Threngena, which, as you know, has three legs. How would you describe it? One of the students raised his hand. I'd call it a three-legged monstrosity, spawned in the deepest hells of... No, Carner said quietly. That kind of writing might have been all right in the earliest days of our subject. But remember, you are no longer dealing with a simple, credulous audience. To achieve the proper effects nowadays, you must underplay. Understand? Underplay. Now, someone else. Mort raised his hand, threw a glance at Eddie and said, How about this tripedal blob of orange protoplasm, octopus-like in its gropings? That's better, Karna said. Tripedal is very nice, very exact. But must you compare it to an octopus? Why not? Mort asked. An octopus, the professor said, is a well-known form of earth life. It inspires no terror, no wonder. You might better compare it, the Threngena, to another strange monster. A Callistan Edelsplayer, for example. He smiled winningly at the class. Eddie frowned and scratched his blonde crew cut. He had liked it better the first way. But Karna should know, of course. He was one of the best-known writers in the entire field, and he had done the college a favour by agreeing to teach the course. Eddie remembered reading some of Karna's stuff. It had scared the living daylights out of him when he was younger. That description of Saturnian brains immobilising Earth Confederation ships, for example. That had been a great yarn. The trouble is, Eddie thought, I'm just not interested. He had had serious doubts about this course. Actually, he had signed up only because Mort had insisted. Any questions at this point? Karna asked. One of the students, a serious-looking fellow wearing black horn-rimmed glasses, raised his hand. Suppose, he asked, suppose you were writing a story speculating on an interstellar combine formed with the purpose of taking over Earth. Would it be permissible, for greater contrast, to make Earth's enemies black-hearted villains? A political thinker, Eddie thought with a sneer. He glanced hopefully at the clock. It wouldn't be advisable, Karna sat casually on the corner of his desk. Make them human also. Show the reader that these aliens, whether they have one head or five, have emotions understandable to them. Let them feel joy and pain. Show them as being misguided. Pure evil in your characters has gone out of fashion. But could I make their leader pure evil? the young man asked, busily jotting down everything Karna had said. I suppose so, Karna said thoughtfully, but give him motivations also. By the way, in dealing with that sort of story, the panoramic kind, remember not to oversimplify the aliens' problems. If they amass an army of twenty million, all have to be fed. If the rulers of fifty scattered star systems meet in conclave, Remember that different star systems have different languages and different races have different nervous systems. Bear in mind also that there would be little logical reason for attacking Earth. The galaxy is filled with so many stars and planets, 
What is the necessity of fighting for one? The horn-rimmed fellow nodded dubiously, writing his notes with tremendous speed. Eddie stifled a yawn. He preferred to think of his villains as pure, unadulterated evil. It made characterization so much easier, and he was getting tremendously bored. Karner answered questions for the next half hour. He told them not to describe Venus as a jungle-choked green hell, never, never to call the moon pock-marked, smallpox pitted, or scarred from centuries of meteoric bombardment. All of this has been said, he explained, millions of times. Do not use clichés. He went on to explain that the red spot of Jupiter need not be called a malevolent red eye, that Saturn's rings don't necessarily resemble a halo, and that the inhabitants of Venus are not Venetians. All common errors, he said. I want a thousand words from each of you next time. I suggest that you choose a planet and write a fresh study of it, avoiding with care all the clichés I mentioned. Class dismissed. Well, what do you think? Mort asked Eddie in the hall. Isn't he great? I mean, he really knows. I'm dropping out of the class, Eddie said, making up his mind. What? Why? Well, Eddie said, there's no reason why I shouldn't call the red spot on Jupiter a malevolent red eye. I put that in a story last month and it sounded good. And that Venetian Threngener, I think it's a monstrosity and I'm going to write about it that way. He paused and his face hardened with conviction. But the real reason, well, I'm just not interested in journalism. I'm dropping Karner's course in fact feature article writing because I want to write fiction. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Not in the Script by Arnold Marmer Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, December 1955. Narrated by Tom Trissel. Colin Schratt studies his image in the silver-framed mirror. His moustache was neatly clipped, his face clean-shaven and well talcumed. His captain's uniform, light blue, was pressed and looked as if it had just been bought. He was fastidious in everything he did. He looked away from the mirror as the valet approached. "'Mr. Barnes is ready to see you, sir,' the valet said. "'Good.' Captain Schratt was ushered into a study where Jules Barnes was waiting. "'Won't you be seated?' Barnes invited. The captain sat, laid his cap on his knee. "'A drink?' "'No, thank you. Mind if I have one?' "'Of course not.' Barnes fixed himself a drink. He seated himself on a sofa, leaned back and said, now what's it all about? What would an intelligence officer want with me? I'm not representing the Americas at this moment, Mr. Barnes, but all of Earth as well. I'm here to ask you to do a service for the world. A service? Barnes sipped at his drink. You must be mistaken about me, Captain. I'm just a playwright. But I haven't made a mistake, Mr. Barnes, and you can save the world just by writing a play. Oh, come now. Mr. Barnes, within two months we shall have a visitor from Mars. Jules Barnes finished his drink. You don't say? I do say. Are you sure you won't have a drink, or have you had too many? Mind if I use your phone? Go right ahead. The captain dialed a number, said into the mouthpiece, General? Schratt, I'm at Barnes. Yes, of course. Have the President put on, will you? The captain turned to Barnes. You'd recognize the voice of William Livingston, the President of the Americas, wouldn't you? Barnes nodded his head silently. He took the receiver from Strat and listened gravely. The captain watched the playwright put down the receiver. Well, he said. Barnes sat down, gulped noisily. I'm listening. We're going to have a visitor from the planet Mars. Now, supposedly, they will be on a friendly mission, but that will not be so. Their purpose is to determine our strength. If they decide we are ahead in nuclear physics and rocket ship expansions, we will be attacked. 
If they decide we are behind in experiments, then we will be safe. I don't understand. Why shouldn't they attack us if they know we are weak? They're not in any great hurry. If they believe we are strong and ready to launch rocket ships into space, then they will stop us, determined we shall never leave our planet to conquer space. If they believe we are weak and backward, they will let us alone for the time being. As long as we aren't a threat, then they'll feel safe, ready to conquer us at their own sweet time. They move when they think we're strong, ready to blast ships into space, ready to conquer the stars. Till then, they'll let us alone, knowing we're weak and ineffectual. How do you know all this? Barnes asked, moving to make himself and Shrat drinks. This time the captain accepted his drink. How can you possibly know of their plans? We've picked up their ship by radar. We've been listening in on their conversations with Mars through a new IBM machine, and Germany has sent their best code experts to give a hand. They broke down the language, and the messages between Mars and their ship was in code. So their expert did a double job, and well too, I might add. All the governments of the world have been alerted. They're all ready to cooperate. Well, where do I come in? We want you to write a play. A play? Yes, a play. And every industry on Earth will be a participant. You will write and direct. The world will be the stage. Don't you see? You will write and direct every move that will convince the Martians we are backward. We are nothing. We are insignificant. They must be convinced our industry doesn't compare with theirs. Our brains are childish to theirs. Our leaders are weak and ineffectual. Our weapons mere toys. You must write this play before they get here. It will be your greatest triumph. It will be the play of all plays. It will be the play that will save the world from destruction. It must be written within a month. That's what we want you to do. Within a month? That's impossible. A month to write a play. A month to rehearse. Not even a month to rehearse. You have to get busy on it right away. But how far are you advanced? Can you conquer space tomorrow? Of course not. Then why go to all this trouble? Just let them see for themselves the way things really are. We can't possibly hurt them now. Why bother putting on an act for them? We are advanced to some degree, of course. Progress can't be stopped. But we don't want them to know exactly how advanced we are. They are our enemy, you must remember that. We have to show them we are weaker than we really are. I see your logic. Good. You will cooperate with us then? Of course. You realize that it must be a silent triumph for you if we are successful? Of course, I am at your service. You will start immediately. I will keep in touch with you daily. You will need facts and figures, of course. You will get a list of industry heads, scientists and military men. They will all be meeting our Martians. They must have their lines to read, their every movements that will convince the Martians of our stupidity. It's going to be some political football at the next election. You can't keep the politicians silent. Oh, yes, we can. This will be more like a project than a play. I'll have to take my leave now, Mr. Barnes. The captain stood up. I have many matters to attend to. Of course. Good day, Captain. Jules Barnes worked on his play every waking hour. His eyes grew tired, his fingers grew stiff, his brain grew weary. The play was finished in twenty-five days. He handed it to Captain Schratt and went to sleep five minutes later. Captain Schratt shrugged off all suggestion of getting a top Broadway director to handle the second assignment, that of directing the participants of the play. So Jules Barnes directed the military, the industry, the sciences, in the performances which would take place when the adversary would come face to face with the Earth's genius. Barnes and Schratt went from government to government by jet, meeting the brains of each power, directing and coaching. Finished, Captain Schratt said, leaning back in his seat as the jet took off for Washington. What if it doesn't come off? Barnes said. Don't think about it. Barnes felt his stomach jump towards his back as the ship hummed its way towards the heavens. He still hadn't gotten used to the jets. When the plane levelled off, he said, We could always capture the Martians, hold them as hostages. 
Do you possibly think they hold as great a price on life as we do? Their philosophy is as different from ours as night and day. You seem to know an awful lot about them. Our men are listening in on every conversation that passes between their ship and Mars. We've learned a lot. I'm beginning to think you're more advanced than you're letting on. In many matters, Mr. Barnes, you're still an outsider. Security, you must understand, especially now. You've done the Earth a great service, but I'm still under orders. There are many things I can't let you in on. If you were a soldier, you'd readily understand. So a certain wall, not too high, though, must always remain between us. I'm not a soldier, true, but I do understand. You may be interested to know that the ship will be landing within the week. Really? I guess I'd better stay out of the way. Oh, you'll be on hand, in case something goes wrong and a new line must be written into the script fast. There must be no blunders. If there are, then we must cover up. So you'll be close by, ready to write, ready to coach. I wonder what they'll look like. You'll be finding out soon enough. In order to avert panic, the world was alerted to the coming of the Martians four days before the strange arrival. They came. Tall and thin, with translucent skin and eyes that were almost invisible, they were that small. There were four, two men and two women. The women's hair was as short as the men's. Their breasts made slight bulges under their tunics. It seemed they had listened in to radio broadcasts and spoke English, French, Italian, Polish and Spanish very well. They knew the Americas was the strongest of the world governments and so had landed there. The year, 1968, became a memorable year the year when contact was made with another planet. Jules Barnes stayed on the sidelines. During the three weeks the Martians remained, there was no need for him, but he stayed by, ready to act in any way he was needed. The Martians went from government to government, ex inspecting industry, meeting scientists and military men. Everything was as friendly as could be. When the Martians retired to their rooms, they had hurried conversations. We were behind the times, our scientists were incredibly stupid, our military men were old ladies, and our industry was only fit to make children's toys. Hidden microphones revealed all this. Everything has gone according to plan, Captain Schratt told Barnes the day the Martians blasted off for their home planet. We've nothing to worry about. I'm glad. I've been on edge the whole time they were here. I've got reports to make out, so I'll have to leave now, but we'll get together again some time. Certainly, Barnes shook hands, and Schratt left the playwright's apartment. Hello, General, Captain Schratt said, entering his office. He took off his cap, tossed it on a leather chair, and went behind his desk. I've come from the President, the General said. He says the time has come. Good, Schratt sat down. I wish I was coming along. You're needed here. What about this fellow Barnes? He knows an awful lot. We've nothing to worry from him. Besides, once we've started, there's nothing anyone can do. Our fleet of spaceships is ready to take off within hours. It's best to wait till the Martian ship is well on its way. Then we can start operations. When we get to Mars, they'll be unprepared. Earth will be supreme. Captain Schratt lit a cigarette. Only Mars could have stopped us if they decided to attack us. Now that threat is gone. They won't know what hit him. Thanks to a playwright and his sense of devotion to Earth. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story... This World is Ours by Emil Petaya Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, July 1952 Narrated by Tom Trussel He must die. It will look like an accident. Shouldn't we take him back with us? We are far from through here. Don't tell me you are developing a sympathy for these miserable creatures. 
Impossible. I merely assumed he might be of some further value in our great crusade. He must die. Max Field was listening at the door. He moved back so that he could breathe again. Those dozens of little wounds in his chest and on his arms and neck stung like fire. His amiable young features were tense but resigned. This was the end. Period. Outside the little cabin an owl hooted. It was a lonely sound, but it was a familiar earth sound, and it brought a lump to his throat. If only there was some way to outwit them. But he had thought of everything. Apparently so had they. That window, for instance, was shuttered and bolted from outside. A sudden noise would bring them in here in no time. The back wall was up against a cliff. There was no outside door in this room. He was supposed to be drunk, befuddled, but he hadn't drank any of the champagne. In that, at least, he had outwitted them. He was to die. No question about that. The only question remaining was how. He sat down on the edge of the bed and pulled out the little notebook he'd been, at odd moments, scribbling the whole story in. Force of habit, perhaps. Max was a science fiction writer. He flipped through the penciled pages. Worth money, this story. He smiled ironically. Yet who would read it, much less believe it? Somebody might, he decided. He would hide it somewhere in this room, maybe slip it through a crack in the flooring, a few pages at a time. He pulled out a stub of pencil and added that final shuddery scene. Alice! Alice! Outside, the owl hooted. It started, as so many stories do, with my phone ringing. I was eating cigarettes and pounding out a cover novel for Gizmo. If there is anything that gripes me where I live, it is some joker calling me up when I'm busy producing and... Hello? Yeah? This is Max Field, the science fiction writer. And while we're on that subject, I happen to be... I am Wallace Starr. It was a funny voice. Funny, strange. It sounded a little like rubbing two pieces of sandpaper together. Really? I pushed out my current camel and sneaked in a few pecks at the old underwood. So sandpaper voice was Wallace Starr. Maybe I was supposed to turn handsprings. You don't know me, the heckler went on, but I'm very familiar with you and your work. I have an important project in mind, a new monthly science fiction magazine to be called Orion. I need a goods assistant editor. You were suggested. Orion, I said. Yes, my book will feature a completely new approach. We will buy only the best material, and each story will concern itself with the constellation Orion and its various systems. All material will be correlated to this end. How does this strike you? You won't find it so easy pinning the best writers down to Orion, I grinned. Writers like Swain and St. Reynard and Rick Planter like Elbow Room. Orion is vast and complex. One hundred and seven solar systems, to be exact. That should provide ample Elbow Room. I whistled. Ought to, but what's the idea? Novelty, Mr. Field. I have studied the imaginative magazines closely, and it occurs to me that they are already beginning to specialise. One of them uses highly technical stories. Another adheres to stories of other planets in this system. Orion will link each story with all the others in it. Instead of a hundred interpretations of the life patterns of Orion, we shall have but one. Of course, casual stories we buy will have to be revamped to fit in. That's where I come in, I guessed. Exactly. But don't you feel that we will wind up with a fascinating pseudo-history of Orion, and that such a magazine could create a furore with its irrealistic slant? I guess so. It tasted like my first olive. But Wallace Starr was obviously burning with enthusiasm. He sounded just a little like a crackpot. 
a rich crackpot, maybe. It will be hard work, Mr. Field, but rewarding. Are you prepared to accept my proposition? He spoke like a man who means business. I hesitated. It is well known that the mortality rate among new fiction magazines is high. I had writing contracts to fill. I was doing okay. Editing a monthly is a full-time job. About salary, I hinted. He named a figure that made my hair curl. What could I say but, when do we start, boss? Star wasn't like any editor I've known. He wasn't like an editor at all. He wasn't much like anybody I've known, which puts him in a class all by himself. He was brown and thin and had peculiarly big eyes like a grasshopper's. He spent so much money getting started, I figured he wasn't long for this racket. But he did have a knack, and the first couple issues, while not wildly successful, went over well. One morning he called me into his office. From the tone of that dry voice of his, I knew I was in for it. "'What's all this?' he buzzed, rattling a manuscript in front of me. From the cheap yellow paper, I knew it was the lead lovelette of the forthcoming issue. Rick Planter was one of our top writers, and also a very bad boy. Rick loved to put an editor on the spot, bless his little pointed head. "'Didn't he change that ending?' I asked. The tick in my left eye started up. I had never had this twitch until the first time I saw Star. I think it was something about those eyes of his. Every time I looked at him. "'He changed it all right,' Star hissed. He turned the Kiriki into villains, when their benevolent plan to spread patent contentment throughout the circle of outer planets was just taking hold, he had the semi-civilized green ones rise up and destroy their power by smashing their means of telepathic communication. How could he do that? I clucked. Supersonic wave interrupter of some kind. I hadn't meant that, and somehow I couldn't help grinning. Trust Rick to latch onto the Kiriki vulnerable point. The Kiriki, as Star had outlined them, were highly communal, like our ants, only very much more advanced. They depended on this intricate pattern of intercommunication, mind with mind, for their very existence, since each Kiriki was by birth fitted to perform only one basic function in their communal society. Their ingenious army of patterned contentment was helpless when reduced by the adaptable green ones to individuals. "'Will you please stop laughing?' Star rasped. "'This hack writer of yours has outraged the history of an ancient noble race!' "'I didn't get a chance to read his revision,' I defended myself. Star had grabbed it off my desk as he went through. "'I told Planter the Kiriki were good guys, not bad guys.' "'Good guys, bad guys!' Star cried. "'How naive can we be? "'Let us hope that our readership is on a different intelligence level, "'otherwise our great plan will fail miserably.' "'It was the way he said it, and I don't think he meant to. "'He was mad, and the fact that my dialogue had lapsed to comic book levels "'gave him the idea, perhaps, that I was too dumb to worry about. "'There had been other hidden meanings behind other things he'd said or done.' My subconscious mind was working on it. "'What plan is that?' I ventured mildly. "'Never mind. Get busy on this. This libel!' My left eye twitched. "'Okay. I'll change it myself. I know Planter's style. By the way, when am I getting that secretary you promised me? My desk's flooded. I need a girl bad.' "'Ah, yes!' It was supposed to be a smile, I guess. Very soon. Meanwhile, kindly fill out this form. I took it without comment and went back to my office. This made altogether the fifth form Star had dreamed up for me to fill out. Must be some weird complex he has, wanting to know what colour socks I prefer and if my mother kept goats. Anyhow, I grinned as I grabbed up the phone and dialed Rick Planter's number it gave star ideas for my Christmas presents for the next twenty years. Yeah, Rick's sleepy voice yawned. It's me. What a head. 
I passed the beef on to him. Good. Shut up, Max, he yawned. I was just having a little fun. Fun, schmun. It's my job. Come off it, Maxie. OK, tell you what. The first outline you sent me about the Kiriki and their habits isn't nearly complete enough. Have that boss of yours dream up a more complete dossier, just for the little old me. I like those Kiriki. They're such smug, heartless devils. Listen, Star's hot for them. He'll buy anything glorifying the Kiriki. There is little dream babies. Sure, sure, here's what you'll do, Maxie. Get Star to make me out a complete dossier on them, but complete. You know me. I like to use the little out-of-the-way touches, like what colour they paint their toenails. I'll give him some stuff that will curl his eyebrows, OK? No more tricks. Cross my cast-iron heart. OK, Rick. But remember, Rick rhymes with tick. How's that? Never mind. The moment Alice walked in my office, I knew she was for me. I guess every guy has a girl all built up in his imagination. A girl who is and has everything he likes. Alice Corey was mine. Soft blue eyes, lots of brown wavy hair, a little well-shaped nose. And let's just say the rest of her was well-shaped too. It was all there, including a lot of hard-to-define details of speech and manner that were exactly right. Maybe it was chemical, or maybe it just added up to every dream I've ever had about my ideal girl. My name is Alice Corey, she said with soft violins in the background. I understand you need an editorial secretary, she went on briskly, when I found myself speechless. I worked two years with Tower Periodicals in London, and— You're hired, I said. But those other girls waiting outside— "'Would you please inform them that the job's filled, Alice?' "'I had to deal with the boss about Alice. "'He didn't like her. "'She was too pretty, he thought. "'Couldn't be efficient. "'He went over her background with a fine-tooth comb. "'He found fault with almost everything about her. "'But I stuck to my guns. "'He had his kiriki. "'Alice was mine, "'and I was damned if I would leave her out of my sight.' She filled my working hours with golden sunshine and my nights with platinum dreams. What's more, she was efficient, and she would work until twelve the night before a deadline without a murmur. She was diffident about having dinner with me, first, but as time went by we spent many an evening together strolling in the park listening to the carousel or sipping chocolate sodas at Howard Johnson's. Alice didn't talk much, but she was a good listener. I must have told her everything I had ever thought or done during those evenings. I was in such a sublime spin these days, I forgot to worry about Wallace Starr's peculiarities. The questions that had sprouted in my subconscious began to fade. I did what I was told. So, strangely, did Rick Planter. I supplied him with a detailed outline which Star made up about the Kiriki. That wasn't enough, so I sent him another, with even more details. He kicked through with story after story about the Kiriki, big dramatic stories, and in each one the patterned contentment boys were built up higher than in the last. Star purred like a kitten. He raised Planter's word rates and my salary. Orion caught on. The fans loved the idea of a pseudo-history of a whole constellation of systems. The Kiriki, with a breathtaking crusade of contentment, sweeping over system after system until finally it outdistanced Orion and tentacled out from the home system into deepest space. It captured the imagination. Where would it end? Eventually we hit Life magazine with a big spread. The slicks went after Rick Planter, but Star had him tied up with an iron-clad contract. After all, the conception was Star's, and I could see why he wouldn't let Planter hit the slicks, because he could not dictate their policies. Only in Orion could he manipulate the strings from behind. 
The Kariki were his babies, and they must follow his pattern. The night before our anniversary issue went to press, it happened. I had left Alice on her doorstep, just off the drive. It was almost midnight, a blazing hot July night. Everybody and his dog was out for a breather. The drive was alive with young lovers, old lovers and dog lovers. It hit me. In my hurry to get away from the office, I had neglected to check with Star about a last-minute cover change. Star hadn't been in all day. The printers would be closing the forms first thing in the morning, and I'd let the change go through without Star's OK. Star never came in until eleven. I found a Wayland drugstore and phoned Star. No answer. I called the operator and found out the line was temporarily out of order. On impulse, I snagged a cross-town bus. I had never been to Stars, never been invited or particularly wanted to visit him. He lived in a loft not far from Third Avenue. It was an ordinary type building of ancient vintage. It would never cop an Oscar for beauty, nor did it smell from Chanel No. 5. I made my way up in the half-dark from one landing to another without enthusiasm. I don't know just what it is about musty office buildings after they've been darkened and bedded down for the night. It isn't anything calculated to cheer. Six flights, and no elevator after eight. I could see right away that Star loved to be alone. Most of the upper-floor offices were empty. My mind snagged hold of some creepy ideas as I mounted those stairs. I thought about Star's odd ways, his odd voice for that matter, as if he had a machine down in his throat, a talking machine designed by a clever somebody who had once heard a human voice. About how hept Star was on the Kiriki, how painstakingly he had drawn them. He talked about them as if they were real. Of course, being a science fiction writer myself, I understood that brand of wackiness, or thought I did. I rapped on his door. There was light pushing out under his door, so I knew he must be there. It was noisy inside, which was why he hadn't heard me. I bent my ear closer. What a noise! It sounded like a bullfrog-grasshopper duet. I banged on the door again. No answer. I tried the doorknob. It turned. I was half in when I stopped cold. This I did not believe. Put it on a book jacket and label it Ed Cartier and I'll buy it. I blinked to make it go away, but it wouldn't. I whimpered. So it was. What my mind had been half suspecting for months and laughing at itself even as it suspected. It was true. The thing at the machine was a giant insect, ten feet high at least. It was brown-green and had lots of claw-like appendages. The most terrible thing about it was its familiarity. I had surveyed it critically on half a dozen of our cover originals. I had quibbled with our artists about it. Not horrible enough, I had said. Well, it was. It was horrible. It was busy with that machine, making noises into a cone and twisting dials and knobs with its many appendages. The noises it made were carefully inflected. Speech, in fact. It was talking into the cone, which absorbed the sounds, and transmitted them. Where? My shoes were glued to the floor. The thing finished talking, snapped off the machine, turned. It saw me. It yelled and tried to duck out. It moved in a blur. Seven pairs of claws flexed out and grabbed for me. Some of the weaving cilia touched me. I screamed at the sting, like a dozen raking barbs tearing my clothes and me. I made the hall yelling. But I couldn't reach the stairs. It got me. It pinned me over the elevator shaft. I bent back further and further so those tentacles couldn't rake my face. Those criss-cross insect eyes were cold as ice, emotionless. 
the barbs made ready to tear me to rags. I shrieked, and I let myself fall. First I didn't think to save myself. Better a clean, jolting death than those hundreds of needle-like cilia. But my hands grabbed involuntarily for something. They caught the cable, clung to it. It was greasy. I went down fast. I wrapped my legs around it, which helped a little, straining to hold back. When I hit bottom, I think every tooth in my head jarred loose. My legs collapsed under me like rubber. For a minute I blacked out. The buzzing over my head snapped me up. I was a goner if I didn't move, but fast. Sobbing, I wrenched my legs to a crouching position and leaped down off the elevator. I dove for the front door when I was outside gulping air, running like Billy Hell for the Lexington subway. I didn't know what else to do, so having put half of Manhattan between me and it, I telephoned Alice. I needed the sound of her voice. I needed her to stop me from shuddering. My tick was slowly jerking my jaw out of alignment. She listened patiently while I dumped in dimes. Max, she asked when I had finished, are you sure you haven't been eating Benzedrine tablets? No, and I'm not drunk. Where are you now? Some joint in Harlem. How long have you been there? She sounded suspicious. Alice, I groaned, if you could only see me. My suit's ripped in a dozen places. I'm all greasy where I slid down the cable and my hands are burned raw. I hurt. Poor boy, she soothed. She was silent for a moment, then became her briskest self. Listen, Max, we have to consider every possibility. This might be a self-hypnotic illusion brought on by overwork. Remember, you've seen these things on many covers and interiors, too. You've lived fictionally with the Kiriki for a year. Consider that. Nuts, I yelled. I'm going to the police. And spend the night in the drunk tank? Alice queried severely. Just who do you think will believe your story? I can take them to this loft. Think, Max. What will they find? Nothing. Even if it is true, do you imagine this, this Kiriki is going to be caught like a fish in a barrel? He has been spotted. Obviously, he will leave the loft at once. She was so right, and I knew it. I groaned. Who or what is this thing? Alice asked, but it was plain she only half believed my story. That's easy, I said bitterly. I should have caught on months ago. It's Wallace Star. Star is a Kiriki. Having better sense than to go home, I rented a cheap room on 125th Street. I didn't sleep much. I paced and ate cigarettes. Very early next morning, I woke up a cleaner on 3rd Avenue and bought a cheap uncalled-for suit out of his window. It was the most uncalled-for suit I ever did see, but it fit pretty well and made me decent. A quick coffee, and I went up to the office. I had given Alice strict orders not to come to work until I found her. I didn't want her mixed up in this. Star hadn't liked her from the first. Maybe he figured she might catch on to him better than me. I picked up a manuscript from the slush pile, called Challenge of the Slime People. The phone made me jump. Morning, Maxie. This is Rick Planter. Rick! I found myself blurting. The most terrifying thing has happened. Invasion of Kirikia, no doubt. Planter had that way. You wanted to wring his neck. Somehow, the way he said it made me backtrack. I didn't want to get the horse laugh from him and all fandom. For the first time I asked myself, could Alice be right? Could it have been an illusion? Listen, Rick, how does this sound for a plot? Suppose an alien, but alien, culture from the stars, decides it wants to take over our system. They don't want to just drop in on us. They dislike physical warfare because it isn't orderly. Also, they don't want to kill any of their numbers or their potential slaves. Also, a sudden alien invasion might drive humans completely off their rocker. So here's what they do. They send down a secret fifth columnist. 
His job is to spread propaganda over the planet, to prepare humans for their advent, make them amenable to this alien culture. Of course, he is to build them up in human minds, make them think their cosmic crusade is beneficent and noble. How would he start? By a newspaper. By ten. Under ordinary circumstances, sure. But wouldn't it be hard to slyly mention what great guy the Hoosies are in a daily newspaper? Any comment about his home folks would stick out like a sore thumb. No, it would have to be something less obvious. How about him buying a science fic? A long, thin shadow blotted the opaque glass door in front of me. The door opened. Wallace Starr stepped in. Shall I get to work on it? Rick asked. Yeah, and make it good. I hung up. Starr walked over to my desk. I picked up my letter opener. You might have told me, he preluded. What? The changes, naturally. I spent three hours at the printer's last night. Didn't get home until after two. He stalked into his office and slammed the door behind him. Then I phoned the printers. Let me talk to Corky, I told the girl who answered. Mr. Corkendall is not here, her Brooklynese voice thrilled. Mr. Corkendall is home in bed, on account of he spent half the night re-exchanging some changes for Mr. Starr. Was Mr. Starr there last night? Why, yes. Sure. Mr. Corkendall informed me he was here until almost two. Mr. Corkendall is not in the habit of prevaricating, Mr. Field. I hung up in a daze. If Wallace Starr was definitely not in his loft apartment at twelve-thirty last night, then— I rang up Alice. No answer. I rang her every fifteen minutes until she did. Where were you? I demanded. Why, Max, she sounded piqued. All right, I'll tell you. I was up at Wallace Starr's apartment. But he's here. I know. I waited until he left. Then I went up to the loft. I told the janitor I worked for Mr. Starr, and he let me in. I went over the place with a fine-tooth comb. Max, there's simply nothing there to get excited about. He's quite neat for a bachelor. Everything very prosaic and natural, except for that big amateur radio of his. Amateur radio? You know, amateur sending and receiving. Mr. Starr is a ham. A ham? I swallowed hard. Alice, you're right. I'm going off my rocker. Just overwork, she protested soothingly. You take your science fiction too seriously. What you need is a nice vacation, away from the office and everything that even smells like work. I'll do it, I said meekly. Right then a thought hit me. It had been simmering in my mind for a long time. Now it exploded into words. Alice, let's make it a honeymoon! She gasped. Max, are you sure you're well enough? Am I? You're just what the doctor ordered to put me back on my rollers. Will you marry me, Alice? Please? Yes, Max, whenever you say. We told nobody where we were going for our two weeks' honeymoon, least of all Star. He grumbled for a while, then kicked through with a nice fat cheque for a wedding present, along with a bottle of good champagne. We hopped in a rented jalopy and headed north along the river. There was a pale round moon overhead, and as we got out of the city and night came on, it brightened and made a glowing path on the water. After a while, we left the main road and headed into the Catskills. At last, we dipped down into a deep little glen where there was a cosy two-room cabin I'd often rented before when I had a tough writing assignment that demanded absolute solitude. There was no one within miles. We unloaded the car like a couple of kids. I practically bought out a delicatessen. Then Alice started fussing around the cabin, putting away my fishing tackle and hanging up some curtains and pictures she had picked up at Woolworth's. I kept on pinching myself to believe she had really married me and marvelling how every little thing she did suited me perfectly. Hungry, darling? You said it. 
I made a tentative bite at her ear, grinning, but she eluded me teasingly. I uncorked the champagne, managed to spill my first glass, then decided I was too hungry to bother with it now. We ate cold chicken and all kinds of fixings. Outside the night it lay deep and warm. The moon shimmered on the evergreens. I got up from my chair and went to Alice. Now she wanted that kiss. She put up her lips. I kissed her. The world rocked. A buzzing noise sounded behind me. It made my blood crawl because it was familiar. I jumped back from Alice just in time. No, I moaned. No, Alice! But it happened. I imagine that I am the only man who ever kissed his bride on their wedding night, then watched her turn into a monstrous bug before his eyes. Outside the owl hooted. Max Field tossed aside his notebook and pounded his knee with his fist. God! To have seen that happen! To sweet little Alice! His dream girl. But naturally, she had been too perfect, actually. She was designed for him, perhaps only a clever illusion clothed in flesh by his own imagination. At any rate, she was a reason for him filling out all those forms, to discover just what he liked in every department, to give them a pattern for Alice. They were cute, even to the point of having Star pretend to dislike her. When Star pretended to poke carefully into her background, that was enough to prevent Max from doing just that, because actually she had no background. It was phony. That phone call they had made to Corky, the girl who answered. That could have been Alice, using a heavy Brooklyn accent to cover her voice. She had been so convincing he hadn't bothered to check back later. Now the two of them were in the kitchen planning his death. Science fiction editor accidentally killed in mountain retreat, bride-stricken. Then the grief-stricken bride would carry on in his place. Orion was going great guns now. It really didn't need Maxfield. And without him, their propaganda machine could move forward all the faster. Forward to the day when the Kiriki Cosmic Crusade moved down into this solar system. The patterned contentment boys would take over. Whose pattern? Kiriki, of course. The kitchen door opened slowly. Max tensed. It was... Alice. She wore that clinging black lace negligee he had bought in an exclusive Fifth Avenue shop. Max. He stood up stiffly, staring. Change, damn you, change! Why, Max, she pouted, don't you love me any more? It was intended to drive him nutty, maybe to suicide. You should have drunk the champagne, she said softly. It would have been easier for you. Would you like a drink now? She held out a glass. All of a sudden he wanted that glass more than he had ever wanted anything in his life, even Alice. It was the end of the line, the dropping-off point. He couldn't take it any more. Not Alice, like that. He walked over to her and took the glass. He lifted it to his lips. Something slapped the glass out of his hand as the window behind him shattered inward. Alice flashed an angry glance at the face in the window, then moved quickly back into the kitchen. Rick! Max's bewilderment changed to sudden hope. Hurry! Planter cried. Get through this window! Max dove through while the brighter yanked him by the elbows. Max was shivering and sweating at the same time, but the cool night breeze helped a little. Where, where in the billy hell did you come from? Rick finished. Been on Star's trail for weeks, had this thing figured out for some time, even before you tipped me off on the phone that day. I followed Star here, been watching and waiting. He was wearing a fish basket, and, incongruously, it was filled with bombs. 
He handed some to Max. Start heaving. Aim for the kitchen door before they close it. He tossed a handful of the bombs into the room. Max followed suit. Inside, the bombs broke, letting out a pungent gas. What is it? Insecticide, Rick grinned. More potent than DDT. Those outlines Star made out furnished the clues. It should do it. Won't they get out the kitchen door? Uh-uh. I sealed it up proper. It and the window. The door between the rooms slammed shut, but not before half a dozen bombs had got through. Rick slammed the shutters, too. They waited. If it doesn't kill them, it'll put them to sleep for hours. Basically, from Star's dossier on the Kiriki, they have all the vulnerable points of our grasshoppers, and fire will destroy them utterly. I'm afraid we can't take chances, so this cabin will have to go. Match? They watched it burn down to the last slab of stilted-up planking. Max stared down at the two small charred remainders of the Kiriki advance guard and shuddered. On the road back to New York, Max said, Do you think they'll try it again? The Kiriki? Not for a while. Like you said, they dislike war. They like it the easy way. Propaganda. Invasion of mines. Well, two can play at that. We'll keep Orion going. Only we'll print the real story. We'll make men detest and despise the Kariki so that any feelers they send down will send them hopping to the furthest end of space. Maybe we can get somebody started on that telepathic wave interrupter of yours too. So if they do land, we can cut them off from each other. We'll work on this reverse propaganda hard. Max jerked his eyes back on the road and put his foot on the gas hard. Sure he would work. Work to save his sanity, too. It wasn't going to be easy to forget a lost dream. A dream that had lived and breathed and promised a lifetime of patterned contentment. It would take a lot of mental welding to hold back the horrors of that kiss. But he would try. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Theft by Bill Venable Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, September 1952 Narrated by Tom Trissel Thompson poured himself a shot of rye and downed it in one quick movement. He then pulled out his tobacco pouch filled his pipe, and applied a flaming match to the bowl. He puffed clouds of fragrant smoke. He frowned deeply. It was a good frown, because Thompson was an ex expert in the art of frowning. This particular frown was a frown of irritated exasperation, because Thompson was an author, and it was late at night, and he'd drunk a quarter of a fifth of rye, and smoked eleven pipefuls of tobacco, and played four LP records, and he still had no ideas. His head swam from the effects of the whiskey, and the tobacco, and the records, but he persevered in his search for an idea for a story. He searched among his records for Le Coq d'Or, and put it on the phonograph, at bass tone and loud volume. After the first few bars, he got up and took it off, still a man without inspiration. He played Hindemith's Variations on a Theme by Russell next, utterly useless. He tried The Age of Anxiety, and followed it with Petruchka, and admittedly he sat down and pondered passages from Rubaiyat, all to no avail. About this time, the little green men came out of the woodwork, they didn't emerge from the woodwork in the manner one might expect, i.e. squeezing through cracks and knotholes like mice and spiders. They just sort of materialised out of it, rather like they had walked through it. There were four of them. Thompson took his pipe from his mouth and looked at them. Ah, he murmured, 
Yes, indeed. He knocked the acid from his pipe and got out of his chair. He put the whisky back in the cupboard and took the record off. Then he sat down again and regarded the little green men. He closed his eyes tightly and held them closed for a minute or so. He opened them and looked at the green men again. Then he rubbed his eyes and pounded his head with his hands. The green men sat in mid-air and stared at him. Thompson regarded them as coldly as possible. Well, said the nearest green man, aren't you going to say hello? Thompson swallowed. Hello, he managed after a moment. Hello, rejoined the other. Thompson nodded his head affably and remained silent. Presently he went to the cupboard and got out the whisky. He poured a shot and downed it in one quick movement. Then he filled his pipe and lit it. He puffed clouds of smoke and stared at the green men through a blue haze. Well, said the nearest green man again, aren't you glad? Thompson nodded genially. We're here to help you write a story, you know, pursued the other. Oh, Thompson brightened. Good. Got any ideas? Naturally. What would you like to write about? Romance? Adventure? Mystery? Fantasy? Let's try, Thompson pursed his lips and looked at the ceiling. A short mystery. Something with a surprise ending that lays you out. Easy, said the other. Try this. He began narrating. Thompson relaxed in his chair and puffed more clouds of smoke. Presently his face lit up. His eyes dilated and his pupils diminished to specks. Ah! he exclaimed. He pulled his chair up to the typewriter and started typing notes, interspersing the green man's narrative with muttered exclamations. The green man finished with an ending that sent Thompson over backwards in his chair. Thompson extricated himself and set up the chair again. Terrific, he said. It'll make my fortune. It will, assented the green man. What you want for it? inquired Thompson craftily. Nothing, responded the vision. Oh, yes, said Thompson. Nothing. Certainly. Well... He withdrew a stack of typewriter paper from his clattered desk. I certainly thank you, fellows. Goodbye. He inserted a sheet in the typewriter. Oh, we're not leaving, said the off colour gnome. You will, said Thompson imperturbably. In the morning I'll have a headache, but you'll be gone. Suit yourself, said the green man. He and his companions rose a foot in the air and sat suspended again. Thompson began to type. Now and then he looked at the green men and smiled, and turned back to his click-clacking on the typewriter. Twenty double-spaced pages later he was done. He made a neat stack of the sheets and shoved them into an envelope, handily pre-addressed to the editorial offices of one of the more prominent magazines. He sealed the envelope and slapped postage on it, then he walked three flights down from his apartment to the street, slipped the envelope into a mailbox, and staggered back up to bed. He awoke, true to his prediction, with a raging headache. He sat up in bed and looked around the room for the little green men. They were nowhere to be seen. His doubts assuaged, he rose stiffly from his bed and careened off the chest of drawers into the bathroom, where he swallowed three aspirins in a glass of water. He turned on the water to see if it was hot, letting it run over his fingers. It was. He took a steaming shower and followed it with an icy one. Then he rubbed himself down with a Turkish towel, and, the towel precariously wrapped around his middle, went back into the bedroom. His eyes bugged out, and he tripped on the edge of the rug and fell heavily to the floor. When he got up, four green men were still sitting complacently on a shaft of sunlight that poured in through the Venetian blind. Thompson's mouth opened and closed, but nothing came out. 
See, said the nearest green man, I told you so. And don't take on so, he added in alarm. You'll dislocate your jaw. Thompson turned his back to the vision and went into the cupboard. He poured a shot of rye and downed it in one quick movement. The bottle in his hand, he sat down on the edge of the bed, regaining his composure. "'Why do you do that?' inquired the gnome with curiosity. "'If I'm going to go on seeing you,' Thompson explained, "'I may as well be drunk. It helps.' "'You mean you still attribute our existence to the effects of alcohol?' inquired the other. "'Oh, no,' Thompson denied vigorously. "'To the bitters!' "'You jest,' said the gnome in hurt tones. "'Don't you want to become a great author?' "'Certainly,' Thompson agreed hastily. "'You mean you have more ideas?' "'An infinite number,' said the green man, waving a deprecatory hand. "'We thought of an excellent novel,' he added, "'while you slept last night. Do you want to hear it?' "'Of course,' Thompson jerked on his shorts. "'Wait, though. I need breakfast first. He writhed into a shirt. "'Plenty of time,' said the greeny. "'While you're gone, we'll assimilate some more ideas.' "'Good,' said Thompson, pulling on his trousers. "'Shall I bring you something to eat?' "'We don't eat,' said the other airily. "'You can bring a spotlight, though. "'We can sit best on a beam of light.' "'Right,' said Thompson. "'He opened the door. "'Good-bye,' remarked the gnome. "'Good-bye.' Thompson hurried from the room. Thompson closed the door of the phone booth behind him. Hello, he said. I'd like to make an appointment with Dr. Vossman, today if possible. Just a moment, said the secretary. He heard her riffle through some papers. What date did you say you wanted an appointment? Today, Thompson repeated. His breathing into the mouthpiece came out quite clearly in the receiver against his ear. "'Dr. Vossman can see you today at three. "'What is the name, please?' "'Thompson. Lawrence Thompson.' "'Very well, sir. Today at three. "'Okay.' "'Thompson hung up and emerged from the phone booth. "'His ham and eggs were ready at the counter, "'and he sat down and wolfed them. "'He counted his money as he went out "'and decided to stop at the hardware store down the street "'and buy a spotlight. "'When he got back to his apartment,' The sunlight was coming in the window at a forty-five-degree angle, and the gnomes were almost sitting on the floor. Thompson plugged in the spotlight and turned the beam upward. There, he told the green men, that okay? Thank you, said the nearest gnome. The whole group rose in the air and floated over to the spotlight beam, sitting rather comfortably on the edge of it. We thought of three excellent short stories while you were away. Would you like to hear them? Yes, yeah, sure, responded Thompson. Might as well take advantage of the situation while it lasted. Very well, said the nearest green man. Here's the first one. At two o'clock, Thompson jerked the last sheet of the last story from the typewriter. He went to the cupboard and got out a coat and tie. I'm going to lunch, he told the gnomes, knotting their tie as he talked. I'll be back pretty soon. Fine, beamed the speaker for the little men. Well, said Thompson uncomfortably, slipping into his coat. You want anything more? We're nicely comfortable, thank you, said the green man. Goodbye. Be seeing you. Thompson slammed the door behind him and added to himself, I hope not. The sign on the door said, Herman Vossman, Psychiatrist, walk in. Thompson walked in. There was nobody in the outer office, so he walked to the inner office door and knocked. Come in, answered a German accent. Thompson entered and beheld a small, thin, respectable man seated behind a modernistic steel desk. Ah, said this apparition, you are Lawrence Thompson. Sit down. Sorry no one is in, was in the outer office, but my secretary is out to lunch. What can I do for you? Well, said Thompson, this is kind of hard to say, doctor, but I'm... 
seeing things, hallucinations. What are you seeing, Mr. Thompson? Thompson fingered the end of his tie. Little green men. Ah, said the doctor. He leaned forward in his chair. And what do these little green men do? They give me ideas for stories. I'm an author. That is all they do? They sit on a beam of light, too. Ah, yes. The doctor took off his spectacles and began to polish them. On a beam of light, of course. When and how did you just see these little men? Well, Thompson ran nervous fingers through his hair. Last night was when I first saw them. They came out of the woodwork. Last night, began the doctor with a flash of intuition. I was drunk, said Thompson. Of course, agreed the doctor. He put his spectacles back on. Then you have nothing to worry about. At least not in my line of work. Perhaps you should see a physician. Delirium tremens is not in my line. Unless you wish me to cure your alcoholism. Thompson waved a hand. Uh-uh. Last night I didn't mind so much. But they were there this morning too. He leaned forward toward the doctor. Would you say I am drunk now? Hard to tell, rejoined the doctor, fluttering his fingers. Offhand, I would say, no. Well, Thompson, the little green men were still there when I left my apartment at two today. I see, said the doctor. That makes a difference, of course. Haven't had but one shot of rye since last night, either. Yes, of course, murmured the psychiatrist. And do you think they are still in your apartment now? Thompson shrugged. Hard to tell. Then, said the doctor confidently, there is only one thing to do. We shall go to your apartment and see. He rose from his chair. Good enough, replied Thompson. Now, said Thompson, we will see if they're gone. He opened the door and peered into the room. He shuddered and entered the apartment. The doctor followed and closed the door. Are they here? inquired the doctor, glancing about the room. Thompson nodded and pointed, sitting on the beam of the spotlight. Ah, yes, the doctor gazed uncomfortably at the spotlight and gave a sigh. He pushed Thompson over to the bed. Lie down, he said. Do you have a medicine cabinet? In the bathroom, Doc, Thompson pointed. The doctor nodded and went into the bathroom and opened the cabinet. He took out a bottle of antihistamine tablets and shook three into his hand. He drew a glass of water and walked back to Thompson's bedside. Sit up, he said. Here, take these. Thompson downed the pills and took a swallow of water. The doctor set the glass on the bedside table and went over and turned off the spotlight. Now, muttered the doctor, he turned on the lamp beside the bed and wrapped a green shirt around the bulb, tying the sleeves together at the top. He turned the lamp on Thompson's face. You say the little men gave you ideas for stories, eh? Thompson shut his eyes and nodded. On the desk, see? Oh, the doctor exhaled. You write these stories down? Naturally, they're great. The doctor walked around to the desk, picked up one of the manuscripts. He whistled softly. Just relax, he said, turning to Thompson. I'm going to read this over. Sure, Doc. Thompson stretched out comfortably on the bed. An hour later, the doctor was finishing the last story and humming softly to himself. He laid down the manuscript and fluttered his fingers airily. His face was a mask. Now, Thompson, he said, look around the room. Are the little green men still here? Thompson opened his eyes and gazed about the room. Yep, he said finally, over there in the corner up by the ceiling. The doctor didn't even look. He took off his spectacles and inserted them carefully in his coat pocket. Then he fished a quarter from his hip pocket and held it up between two fingers. 
Thompson, he said softly, look. Thompson looked. The quarter spun. The lamp above his face cast a soft green light. The little green men aren't there, Thompson. Yes, they are, remarked Thompson petulantly. No, they're not, soothed the doctor. Yes, no, said the doctor firmly. No, inquired Thompson sleepily. No. You imagine them, breathed the doctor. They aren't here. Not there at all. Can you hear me, Thompson? Yes. Now forget all about your little green men. You can forget about them. You will forget about them. The doctor's voice was a monotone. They never were there. You will never see them again. Never, Thompson. Never see them again. Never again, Thompson. Now go to sleep. You've been dreaming. Thompson relaxed. Thompson? The sleeping man lay still, eyes shut, breathing even. The doctor exhaled softly. Why did he do that? queried the nearest green man. He's convinced. He'll never see us again. Naturally, said the doctor. He didn't even turn around. He got his spectacles out of his pocket and adjusted them on his nose. He turned to face the little green men. Come on, he said, waving a hand toward the door. All my life I've wanted to be a great author. You fellows are going to tell me what to write. The little green men shifted several feet nearer to him. Crime, weird, mystery, adventure, or romance, said the nearest gnome. Fantasy, said the doctor. Let's go. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. What Shall It Profit? by Paul Anderson Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, June 1956 Narrated by Tom Tudor the chickens got out of the coop and flew away three hundred years ago, said Barwell. Now they're coming home to roost, he hiccuped. His finger wobbled to the dial and clicked off another whisky. The machine pondered the matter and flashed an apologetic sign. Please deposit your money. Oh, damn, said Barwell, I am broke. Raddick shrugged and gave the slot a two-credit piece. It slid the whisky out on a tray with his change. He stuck the coins in his pouch and took another careful sip of beer. Barwell grabbed the whisky glass like a drowning man. He would drown, thought Radek, if he sloshed much more into his stomach. There was an Asian whine to the music drifting past the curtains into the booth. Radek could hear the talk and laughter well enough to catch their raucous overtones. Somebody swore as dice rattled wrong for him. Somebody else shouted coarse good wishes as his friend took a hostess upstairs. He wondered why Vice was always so cheerless when he went into a place and paid for it. "'I'm going to get drunk tonight,' announced Barwell. "'I'm going to get so high in the stony sky you'll need a radar to find me. Then I shall raise the red flag of revolution.' "'And tomorrow?' asked Ruddick quietly. Barwo grimaced. Don't ask me about tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll be among the great leisure class. To hell with the euphemisms. The unemployed. Nothing I can do that some goddamn machine can't do quicker and better. So a benevolent state will feed me and clothe me and house me and give me a little spending money to have fun on. This is known as citizen's credit. They used to call it a dole. Tomorrow... I shall have to be more systematic about the revolution. Join the League or something. The trouble with you, Roddick needled him, is that you can't adapt. Technology has made the labour of most people, except the first-rank creative genius, unnecessary. This leaves the majority with a void of years to fill somehow. A sense of uprootedness and lost self-respect, which is rather horrible, and in any case... They don't like to think in scientific terms. 
It doesn't come natural to the average man. Barwell gave him a bleary stare out of a flushed, sagging face. I suppose you're one of the geniuses, he said. You've got work. I'm adaptable, said Radek. He was a slim, youngish man with dark hair and sharp features. I'm not greatly gifted, but I found a niche for myself. Newsman. I do legwork for a major commentator. Between times, I'm writing a book, my own analysis of contemporary historical trends. It won't be anything startling, but it may help a few people think more clearly and adjust themselves. And so you like this rotten solar union? Barwell's tone became aggressive. Not everything about it, no. So there is a wave of anti-scientific reaction all over Earth. Science is being made the scapegoat for all our troubles. But like it or not, you fellows will have to accept the fact that there are too many people and too few resources for us to survive without technology. Some technology, sure, admitted Barwell. He took a ferocious swig from his glass. Not this hell-born stuff we've been monkeying around with. I tell you, the chickens have finally come home to roost. Radek was intrigued by the archaic expression. Barwell was no moron. He'd been a correlative clerk at the Institute for several years, not a position for fools. He had read, actually read, books, and thought about them. And today he had been fired. Radek chanced across him, drinking out of vast resentment, and attached himself like a reverse lamprey, buying most of the liquor. There might be a story in it somewhere. There might be a lead to what the Institute was doing. Radek was not anti-scientific, but neither did he make gods out of people with technical degrees. The Institute must be up to something unpleasant. Otherwise, why all the mystery? If the facts weren't uncovered in time, if whatever they were brewing came to a head, it could touch off the final convulsion of lynch law. Barwell leaned forward, his finger wagged. Three hundred years now. I think it's three hundred years since X-rays came in. Damn scientists fooling around with X-rays, atomic energy, radioactives. Sure, safe levels, established tolerances. But what about the long-range effects? What about cumulative genetic effects? Those chickens are coming home at last. No use blaming our ancestors, said Radek. Be rather pointless to go dance on their graves, wouldn't it? Barwell moved closer to Radek. His breath was powerful with whisky. But are they in those graves? he whispered. Huh? Look, been known for a long time, ever since the first atomic energy work. Heavy but non lethal doses of radiation shorten lifespan. You will grow old faster if you get a strong dose. Why do you think with all our medicines we're not two, three hundred years old? Backgrounds count's gone up, that's why. Radioactives in the air, in the sea, buried under the ground. Gamma rays, not entirely absorbed by shielding. Sure, sure, they tell us their levels are still harmless. But it's more than the level in nature by a good big factor, two or three. Radek sipped his beer. He'd been drinking slowly, and the beer had gotten warmer than he liked, but he needed a clear head. That's common knowledge, he stated. The lifespan hasn't been shortened any either. Because of more medicines, more ways to help cells patch up radiation damage. All but worst radiation sickness been curable for a long time. Barwell waved his hand expansively. They knew, even back then, he mumbled. If radiation shorten lives, radiation sickness cures or to prolong it, huh? Reasonable? Only the goddamn scientists. Population problem. Social stasis if everybody lived for centuries. Kept it secret. Easy to do. Change your name and face over then. Twenty years. Keep to yourself. Don't make friends among the short-lived. You might see him grow old and die. Might start feeling sorry for him. And that would never do, would it? Coldness tingled along Radek's spine. He lifted his mug 
and pretended to drink. Over the rim his eyes stayed on Barwell. That's why they fired me. I know. I know. I got ears. I overheard things. I read notes not intended for me. They fired me. It's a wonder they didn't murder me. Barwell shuddered and peered at the curtains, as if trying to look through them. Or do you think? Maybe. No, said Raddick, I don't. Let's stick to the facts. I take it you found mention of work on, shall we say, increasing the life span? Perhaps a mention of successes with rats and guinea pigs, right? So what's wrong with that? They wouldn't want to announce anything till they were sure, or the hysteria. Barwell smiled with an irritating air of omniscience. More than that, friend. More than that. Lots more. Well, what? Barwell peered about him with exaggerated caution. One thing I've found in files. Plans of whole buildings and grounds. Great, great big room. Lots of rooms. Way, way underground. Secret. Only the kitchen was making food and sending it down there. Human food. Food for people I never saw. People who never came up. Barwell buried his face in his hands. Don't feel so good. Whirling. Roddick eased his head to the table. Out like a spent credit. The newsman left the booth and addressed a bouncer. Chap in there has had it. Uh-huh. Want to help me get him to your boat? No, I hardly know him. A bill exchanged hands. Put him in your dust room to sleep it off and give him breakfast with my compliments. I'm going out for some fresh air. The wreck house stood on a Minnesota bluff overlooking the Mississippi River. Beyond its racket and multicolored glare there was darkness and wooded silence. Here and there the lights of a few isolated houses gleamed. The river slid by, talking, ruffled with moonlight. Luna was nearly full. Squinting into her cold, ashen face, Radek could just see the tiny spark of a city. Stars were strewn carelessly over heaven. He recognized the ember that was Mars. Perhaps he ought to emigrate. Mars, Venus, even Luna. There was more hope on them than Earth ever had. No mechanical packaged cheer. People had work to do and in their spare time made their own pleasures. No civilization cracking at the seams because it could not assimilate the technology it must have. Out in space, men knew very well that science had carried them to their homes and made those homes fit to dwell on. Roddick strolled across the parking lot and found his airboat. He paused by its iridescent teardrop to start a cigarette. Suppose the Institute of Human Biology was more than it claimed to be, more than a set of homes and laboratories where congenial minds could live and do research. It published discoveries of value. But how much did it not publish? Its personnel kept pretty aloof from the rest of the world, not unnatural in this day of growing estrangement between science and public. But did they have a deeper reason than that? Suppose they did keep immortals in those underground rooms. A scientist was not ordinarily a good political technician, but he might think he could be. He might react emotionally against a public beginning to throw stones at his house and consider taking the reins, for the people's own good, of course. A lot of misery had been caused the human race for its own alleged good. Or if the scientist knew how to live forever, he might not think Joe Smith, or Carlos Imbanius, or Wang Yuan, or Johannes Umfanduma good enough to share immortality with him. Radek took a long breath. The night air felt fresh and alive in his lungs after the tavern's staleness. He was not currently married, but there was a girl with whom he was thinking seriously of making a permanent contract. He had friends, not lucent razor minds, 
but decent, unassuming, kindly people, brave with man's old quiet bravery in the face of death and ruin and the petty tragedies of every day. He liked beer and steaks, fishing and tennis, good music and a good book, and the exhilarating strain of his work. He liked to live. Maybe a system for becoming immortal, or at least living many centuries, was not desirable for the race. But only the whole race had authority to make that decision. Roddick smiled at himself, twistedly, and threw the cigarette away and got into the boat. Its engine murmured, sucking cast power. The riding lights snapped on automatically, and he lifted into the sky. It was not much of a lead he had, but it was as good as it was ever likely to get. He set the autopilot for southwest Colorado and opened the jets wide. The night whistled darkly around his cabin. Against wan stars, he made out the lamps of other boats flitting across the world and somehow intensifying the loneliness. Work to do. He called the main office in Dallas unit and taped a statement of what he knew and what he planned. Then he dialed the nearest library and asked the robot for information on the Institute of Human Biology. There wasn't a great deal of value to him. It had been in existence for about 250 years, more or less concurrently with the Psychotechnic Institute, and for quite a while affiliated with that organization. During the humanist troubles, when the psychotechs were booted out of government on earth and their files ransacked, it had dissociated itself from them and carried on unobtrusively. How much of their secret records had it taken along? Since the restoration, it had grown, drawing in many prominent researchers and making discoveries of high value to medicine and bioengineering. The current director was Dr. Marcus Lang, formerly of New Harvard, the University of Luna, and, no matter, he had been running the show for eight years after his predecessor's death. Or had Tokugama really died? He couldn't be identical with Lang. He had been a short Japanese, and Lang was a tall Negro, too big a jump for any surgeon not to mention their simultaneous careers. But how far back could you trace Lang before he became fakeable records of birth and schooling? What young fellow named Yamatsu or Hideki was now polishing glass in the labs and slated to become the next director? How fantastic could you get on how little evidence? Radek let the text fade from the screen and sat puffing another cigarette, it was a while before he demanded references on the biology of the ageing process. It was tough sledding. He couldn't follow the mathematics or the chemistry very far. No good popularizations were available. But a newsman got an ability to winnow what he learned. Radek didn't have to take notes. He'd been through a mind-training course. After an hour or so, he sat back and reviewed what he had gotten. The living organism was a small island of low entropy in a universe tending constantly toward gigantic disorder. It maintained itself through an intricate set of hemostatic mechanisms. The serious disruption of any of these brought the life processes to a halt. Shock, disease, the bullet in the lungs or the axe in the brain, death But hundreds of thousands of autopsy had never given an honest verdict of death from old age. It was always something else. Cancer, heart failure, sickness, stroke. Age was at most a contributing cause, decreasing resistance to injury and power to recover from it. One by one, the individual causes had been licked. Bacteria and protozoa and viruses were slaughtered in the body. Cancers were selectively poisoned. Cholesterol was dissolved out of the arteries. Surgery patched up damaged organs, and the new regeneration techniques replaced what had been lost, even nervous tissue. Offhand, there was no more reason to die, unless you met murder or an accident. But people still grew old. 
the process wasn't as hideous as it had been. You needn't shuffle in arthritic feebleness. Your mind was clear. Your skin wrinkled slowly. Centenarians were not uncommon these days, but very few reached a hundred and fifty. Nobody reached two hundred. Imperceptibly, the fires burned low. Vitality was diminished, strength faded, hair whitened, eyes dimmed. The body responded less and less well to regenerative treatment. Finally, it did not respond at all. You got so weak that some small thing you and your doctor could have laughed at in your youth took you away. You still grew old, and because you grew old, you still died. The unicellular organism did not age, but age was a meaningless word in that particular case. A man could be immortal via his germ cells. The microorganism could too, but it gave the only cell it had. Personal immortality was denied to both man and microbe. Could sheer mechanical wear and tear be the reason for the decline known as old age? Probably not. The natural regenerative powers of life were better than that, and observations made in freefall, where strain was minimised, indicated that while null gravity had an alleviating effect, it was no key to living forever. Something in the chemistry and physics of the cells themselves, then. They did tend to accumulate heavy water. That had been known for a long time. Hard to see how that could kill you. The percentage increase in a lifetime was so small. It might be a partial answer. You might grow old more slowly if you drank only water made of pure isotopes. But you wouldn't be immortal. Roddick shrugged. He was getting near the end of his trip. Let the Institute people answer his questions. The Four Corners Country is so named because four of the old American states met there back when there were still significant political units. For a while, in the twentieth century, it was overrun with uranium hunters, who made small impressions on its tilted emptiness. It was still a favourite vacation area, and the resorts were lost in that great huddle of mountains and desert. You could have a lot of privacy here. Gliding down over the moon-ghostly Pueblo ruins of Mesa Verde, Radek peered through the windscreen. There, ahead, lights glowed around the walls, spread across half a mesa. Inside them was a parkscape of trees, lawns, gardens, arbours, cottage units. The Institute housed its people well. There were four large buildings at the centre, and Radek noted gratefully that several windows were still shining in them. Not that he had had any compunctions about getting the great Dr. Lang out of bed, but he ignored the public landing field outside the walls and set his boat down in the paved courtyard. As he climbed out, half a dozen guards came running. They were husky men in blue uniforms, armed with stunners, and the dim light showed faces hinting they wouldn't be sorry to feed him a beam. Radek dropped to the ground, folded his arms, and waited. The breath from his nose was frosty under the moon. "'What the hell do you want?' The nearest guard pulled up in front of him and laid a hand on his shotgun. "'Who the devil are you? Don't you know this is private property? What's the big idea, anyway?' "'Take it easy,' advised Radek. "'I have to see Dr. Lang at once. Emergency. "'You didn't call for an appointment, did you?' "'No, I didn't.' "'All right, then.' "'I didn't think he'd care to have me give my reasons over a radio. "'This is confidential and urgent.' "'The men hesitated, uncertain before such an outrageous violation of all civilised canons. "'I don't know, friend. He's busy. "'If you want to see Dr. McCormick, Dr. Lang, ask him if I may. "'Tell him I have news about his longevity process.' "'His what?' Radek spelled it out and watched the man go. Another one made some ungracious remark and frisked him with needless ostentation. 
a third was more urbane. Sorry to do this, but you understand we've got important work going on. Can't you have just anybody busting in? Sure, that's all right. Radek shivered in the still chill air and pulled his cloak tighter about him. Viruses and stuff around. If any of that got loose, you understand. Well, it wasn't a bad cover-up. None of these fellows looked very bright. IQ treatments could do only so much. Thereafter you got down to the limitations of basic and unalterable brain microstructure. And even among the more intellectual workers, how many Barwells were there, handling semi-routine tasks, but not permitted to know what really went on under their feet? Radek had a brief irrational wish that he'd worn boots instead of sandals. The first guard returned. "'He'll see you,' he grunted. "'And you better make it good, because he's one mad doctor.' Radek nodded, and followed two of the men. The nearest of the large square buildings seemed given over to offices. He was led inside down a short length of glow-lit corridor, and halted while the scanner on a door marked, Lang, Director, observed him. "'He's clean, boss,' said one of the escort. "'All right,' said the annunciator. "'Let him in, but you two stay just outside.' It was a spacious office, but austerely furnished, a telewindow reflected green larches and a sun-splattered waterfall somewhere on the other side of the planet. Lang sat alone behind the desk, his hands engaged with some papers that looked like technical reports. He was a big, heavy-shouldered man, his hair grey, his chocolate face middle-aged and tired. He did not rise. Well, he snapped. My name is Arnold Radek. I'm a news service operator. Here's my card if you wish to see it. Pharaoh had it easy, said Lang in a chill voice. Moses only called the seven plagues down on him. I have to deal with your sort. Radek placed his fingertips on the desk and leaned forward. He found it unexpectedly hard not to be stared down by the other. "'I know very well I've laid myself open to a lawsuit by coming in as I did,' he stated. "'Possibly, when I'm through, I'll be open to murder.' "'Are you feeling well?' There was more contempt than concern in the deep tone. "'Let me say first off, I believe I have information about a certain project of yours, one you badly want to keep a secret. I've taped a record at my office of what I know and where I'm going.' If I don't get back before ten hundred hours, central time, and wipe that tape, it'll be heard by the secretary. Lang took an exasperated breath. His fingernails whitened on the sheets he still held. Do you honestly think we would be so, I won't say unscrupulous, so stupid as to use violence? No, said Radek, of course not. All I want is a few straight answers. I know you're quite able to lead me up the garden path, feed me some line of pap, and hustle me out again. But I won't stand for that. I mentioned my tape only to convince you that I'm in earnest. You're not drunk, murmured Lang. But there are a lot of people running loose who ought to be in a mental hospital. I know. Radek sat down without waiting for an invitation. Anti-scientific fanatics. I'm not one of them. You know Darrell Burkhart's news commentaries? I supply a lot of his data and interpretations. He's one of the leading friends of genuine science, one of the few you have left. Roddick gestured at the card on the desk. Read it, right there. Lang picked the card up and glanced at the lettering and tossed it back. Very well. That's still no excuse for breaking in like this. You... It can't wait, interrupted Radek. There are a lot of lives at stake. Every minute we sit here, there are perhaps a million people dying, perhaps more. I haven't the figures. And everyone else is dying all the time, millimetre by millimetre. We're all born dying. Every minute you hold back the cure for old age, you murder a million human beings. This is the most fantastic. 
Let me finish. I get around, and I'm trained to look a little bit more closely at the facts everybody knows, the ordinary commonplace facts we take for granted and never think to inquire about because they are so ordinary. I've wondered about the Institute for a long time. Tonight I talked at great length with a fellow named Barwell. Remember him? A clerk here. You fired him this morning for being too nosy. He had a lot to say. Hmm. Lang sat quiet for a while. He didn't rattle easily. He couldn't be snowed under by fast, aggressive talk. While Radek spat out what clues he had, Lang calmly reached into a drawer and got out an old-fashioned briar pipe, stuffed it, and lit it. "'So what do you want?' he asked when Radek paused for breath. "'The truth, damn it!' "'There are privacy laws. It was established long ago that a citizen is entitled to privacy if he does nothing against the common wheel. "'And you are! You're like a man who stands on a river bank and has a life belt and won't throw it to a man drowning in the river!' Lang sighed. "'I won't deny we're working on longevity,' he answered. "'Obviously we are. The problem interests biologists throughout the solar system. But we aren't publicising our findings as yet for a very good reason. You know how people jump to conclusions. Can you imagine the hysteria that would arise in this already unstable culture if there seemed to be even a prospect of immortality? You yourself are a prime case.' On the most tenuous basis of rumour and hypothesis, you've decided that we have found a vaccine against old age and are hoarding it. You come bursting in here in the middle of the night, demanding to be made immortal immediately, if not sooner. And you are comparatively civilised. There are enough lunatics who'd come here with guns and start shooting up the place. Roddick smiled bleakly. Of course I know that, and you ought to know the outfit I work for is reputable. If you have a good lead on the problem and haven't solved it yet, you can trust us not to make that fact public. All right. Lang mustered an answering smile, oddly warm and charming. I don't mind telling you, then, that we do have some promising preliminary results. But, and this is the catch, we estimate it will take at least a century to get anywhere. Biochemistry is an inconceivably complex subject. What sort of results are they? It's highly technical. Has to do with enzymes. You may know that enzymes are the major device through which the genes govern the organism all through life. At a certain point, for instance, the genes order the body to go through the changes involved in puberty. At another point, they order that gradual breakdown we know as ageing. In other words, said Radek slowly, the body has a built-in suicide mechanism. Well, if you want to put it that way, I don't believe a word of it. It makes a lot more sense to imagine that there's something which causes the breakdown, a virus maybe, and the body fights it off as long as possible, but at last it gets the upper hand. The whole key to evolution is the need to survive. I can't see life evolving its own anti-survival factor. But nature doesn't care about the individual, friend Radek, only about the species. And the species, with a rapid turnover of individuals, can evolve faster, become more effective. Then why does man, the fastest evolving metazoan of all, have one of the longest lifespans? He does, you know, among mammals at any rate. Seems to me our bodies must be all around better than average, better able to fight off the death virus. Fish live a longer time, sure, and maybe in the water they aren't so exposed to the disease. Mayflies are short-lived. Have they simply adapted their life cycle to the existence of the virus? Lang frowned. You appear to have studied this subject enough to have some mistaken ideas about it. I can't argue with a man who insists on protecting his cherished irrationalities with fancy verbalisms. And you appear to think fast on your feet, Dr. Lang, Radek laughed. Maybe not fast enough, but I'm not being paranoid about this. You can convince me. How? Show me. Take me into those underground rooms and show me what you actually have. I'm afraid that's impossible. All right, Radek stood up. I hate to do this, but a man must either earn a living or go on the public freeloading roll, which I don't want to do. 
The facts and conjectures I already have will make an interesting story. Lang rose too, his eyes widening. You can't prove anything. Of course I can't. You are sitting on all the proof. But the public reaction! God in heaven, man, those people can't think. No, they can't, can they? He moved toward the door. Good night. Roddick's muscles were taut. In spite of everything that had been said, a person hounded to desperation could still do murder. There was a great quietness as he neared the door. Then Lang spoke. The voice was defeated, and when Roddick looked back it was an old man who stood behind the desk. You win. Come along with me. They went down an empty hall, after dismissing the guards, and took an elevator below ground. Neither of them said anything. Somehow the sag of Lang's shoulders was annoying in Roddick's conscience. When they emerged, it was to transfer past a sentry, where Lang gave a password and okayed his companion, to another elevator which purred them still deeper. I— The newsman cleared his throat, awkwardly. I repeat what I implied earlier. I am here mostly as a citizen interested in the public welfare, which includes my own, of course, and my family's if I ever have one. If you can show me valid reasons for not breaking this story, I won't. I'll even let you hypno-condition me against doing it, voluntarily or otherwise. Thanks, said the director. His mouth curved upward, but it was a shaken smile. That's decent of you, and we'll accept. I think you'll agree with our policy. What more worries me is the rest of the world. If you could find out as much as you did— Roddick's heart jumped between his ribs. Then you do have immortality. Yes, but I'm not immortal. None of our personnel are, except— Here we are. There was a hidden sussurrus of machinery as they stepped out into a small bare entry room. Another guard sat there, beside a desk. Past him was a small door of immense solidity, the door of a vault. "'You'll have to leave everything metallic here,' said Lang. "'A steel object could jump so fiercely as to injure you. Your watch could be ruined. Even coins would get uncomfortably hot. Eddy currents, you know. We're about to go through the strongest magnetic field ever generated.' Silently, dry-mouthed, Radek piled his things on the desk. Lang operated a combination lock on the door. There are nervous effects, too, he said. The field is actually strong enough to influence the electric discharges of your synapses. Be prepared for a few nasty seconds. Follow me and walk fast. The door opened on a long, narrow corridor several metres long. Radek felt his heart bump crazily, his vision blurred, and there was panic screaming in his brain and a sweating tingle in his skin. Stumbling through nightmare, he made it to the end. The horror faded. They were in another room, with storage facilities and what resembled a spaceship's airlock in the opposite wall. Lang grinned shakily. No fun, is it? What's it for? gasped Radek to keep charged particles out of here, and the whole set of chambers is five hundred metres underground, sheathed in ten metres of lead brick, and surrounded by tanks of heavy water. This is the only place in the solar system, I imagine, where cosmic rays never come. You mean— Lang knocked out his pipe and left it in a gaboon. He opened the lockers to reveal a set of air suits complete with helmets and oxygen tanks. We put these on before going any further, he said. Infection on the other side. We're the infected ones. Come on, I'll help you. As they scrambled into the equipment, Lang added conversationally, This place has to have all its own stuff, of course. Its own electric generators and so on. The ultimate power source is isotopically pure carbon burned in oxygen. We use a nuclear reactor to create the magnetic field itself, but no atomic energy is allowed inside it. He led the way into the airlock, 
closed it and started the pumps. We have to flush out all the normal air and substitute that from the inner chambers. How about food? Barwell said food was prepared in the kitchens and brought here. Synthesized out of the elements recovered from waste products. We do cook it topside, taking precautions. A few radioactive atoms get in, but not enough to matter as long as we are careful. We are so cramped for space down here that we have to make some compromises. I think... Radek fell silent. As the lock was evacuated, his unjointed air suit spread eagled and held him prisoner, but he hardly noticed. There was too much else to think about, too much to grasp at once. Not till the cycle was over and they had gone through the lock did he speak again. Then it came harsh and jerky. I begin to understand. How long has this got on? It started about two hundred years ago, an early institute project. Lang's voice was somehow tinny over the helmet phone. At that time, it wasn't possible to make really pure isotopes in quantity, so there were only limited results, but it was enough to justify further research. This particular set of chambers and chemical elements is 150 years old. A spectacular success. A brilliant confirmation from the very beginning, and the Institute has never dared reveal it. Maybe they should have back then. Maybe people could have taken the news, but not now. These days the knowledge would whip men into a murderous rage of frustration. They wouldn't believe the truth. They wouldn't dare believe, and God alone knows what they'd do. Looking around, Radek saw a large plastic-lined room filled with cages. As the lights went on, white rats and guinea pigs stirred sleepily. One of the rats came up to nibble at the wires and regard the humans from beady pink eyes. Lang bent over and studied the label. This fellow is, um, sixty-six years old still fat and sassy, in perfect condition, as you can see. Our oldest mammalian inmate is a guinea pig, a hundred and forty-five years. This one here. Lang stared at the immortal beast for a while. It didn't look unusual, only healthy. How about monkeys? he asked. We tried them, finally gave it up. A monkey is an active animal. It was too cruel to keep them penned up forever. They even went insane, some of them. Footfalls were hollow as Lang led the way toward the inner door. Do you get the idea? Yes, I think I do. If heavy radiation speeds up ageing, then natural radioactivity is responsible for normal ageing. Quite. A matter of cells being slowly deranged through decades in the case of man, the genes which govern them being mutilated, chromosomes ripped up, nucleoplasm and cytoplasm irreversibly damaged, and, of course, a mutated cell often puts out the wrong combination of enzymes, and if it regenerates at all, it replaces itself by one of the same kind. The effect is cumulative, more and more defective cells every hour. A steady bombardment, all your life. Here on Earth, seven cosmic rays per second ripping through you, and you yourself are radioactive. You include radiocarbon and radiopotassium and radiophosphorus, Earth and the planets, the atmosphere, everything radiates. Is it any wonder that at last our organic mechanism starts breaking down? The marvel is that we live as long as we do. The dry voice was somehow steadying. Radek asked, And this place is insulated? Yes. The original plant and animal life in here was grown exogenetically from single-cell zygotes, supplied with air and nourishment built from pure stable isotopes. The Institute had to start with low forms naturally. At that time it wasn't possible to synthesize proteins to order, 
but soon our workers had enough of an ecology to introduce higher species, eventually mammals. Even the first generation was only negligibly radioactive. Succeeding generations have been kept almost absolutely clean. The lamps supply ultraviolet. The air is recycled. Well, in principle, it's no different from an ecological unit spaceship. Radek shook his head. He could scarcely get the words out. People? Humans? For the past 120 years, it wasn't hard to get germplasm and grow it. The first generation reproduced normally. The second could if lack of space didn't force us to load their food with chemical contraceptive. Behind his faceplate, Lang grimaced. I'd have never have allowed it if I'd been director at the time. But now I'm stuck with the situation. The legality is very doubtful. How badly do you violate a man's civil rights when you keep him a prisoner but give him immortality? He opened the door, an archaic manual type. We can't do better for them than this, he said. The volume of space we can enclose in a magnetic field of the necessary strength is already at an absolute maximum. Light sprang automatically from the ceiling. Radek looked in at a dormitory. It was well kept, the furniture ornamental. Beyond it he could see other rooms, recreation, he supposed vaguely. The score of hulks in beds hardly moved. Only one woke up. He blinked, yawned, and shuffled toward the visitors, quite nude, his long hair tangled across the low forehead, a loose grin on the mouth. "'Hello, Bill,' said Lang. "'Ah, uh, got something? Got something for Bill?' A hand reached out, begging. Radek thought of a trained ape he had once seen. "'This is Bill,' Lang spoke softly, as if afraid his voice would snap. "'Our oldest inhabitant, one hundred and nineteen years old, and he has the physique of a man of twenty. They mature, you know, reach their peak, and never fall below it again. Got something, Doc, huh? I'm sorry, Bill, said Lang. I'll bring you some candy next time. The moron gave an animal sigh and shambled back. On the way, he passed a sleeping woman, and edged toward her with a grunt. Lang closed the door. There was another stillness. Well, said Lang, now you've seen it. You mean, you don't mean immortality makes you like that? Oh no, not at all. But my predecessors chose low-grade stock on purpose. Remember those monkeys? How long do you think a normal human could remain sane, cooped up in a little cave like this and never daring to leave it? That's the only way to be immortal, you know. And how much of the race could be given such elaborate care, even if they could stand it? Only a small percentage. Nor would they live forever. They are already contaminated. They were born radioactive. And whatever happens, who's going to remain outside and keep the apparatus in order? Radek nodded. His neck felt stiff and within the air suit he stank with sweat. I've got the idea. And yet, if the facts were known, if my questions had to be answered, how long do you think a society like ours would survive? Radek tried to speak, but his tongue was too dry. Lang smiled grimly. Apparently, I've convinced you. Good. Fine. Suddenly his gloved hand shot out and gripped Radex's shoulder. Even through the heavy fabric, the newsman could feel the bruising fury of that clasp. "'But you're only one man,' whispered Lang, "'an unusually reasonable man for these days. "'There'll be others. "'What are we going to do?' The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. To infinity and beyond.